On uh, week two, we talked about God's call to holiness as we've moved from uh, the review of His holiness as a God and how we are um, incapable of approaching Him, that we have absolutely no ability to get close to Him on our own and that there's nothing that we could do to fix that situation. We come finally to uh, reading a big chunk of Leviticus. So we've promised a class on Leviticus and we've gotten through one verse. We will hopefully get through one chapter tonight. And so we will uh, make a little headway and start chipping away at some of these chapters. I can certainly guarantee that we will not make it through the whole book, but uh, we'll get as far along as I think we can and uh, really cover what God has laid on my heart. So tonight, um, God has called his people to holiness, and now he equips. We see that he does that over and over again through his scripture, that he's going to call someone to something, and then he's going to provide whatever they need to do what he's told them to do. So we have come to this point of our uh, text where we want someone to read a whole chapter. So if someone can read Leviticus chapter 1, if you feel the need to break that up, then we can certainly have somebody read, say, verse 1 through 9 and someone else 10 through 17. But so wait, how long is the... 17 verses. Can I ask a question? Sure. The... Yep. Is that at period specific, you think? Or... So that's actually, as far as I can tell, because it's just a stock photo, it seems to have Soviet markings on it to me which would probably mean that it comes from an Islamic country that had Soviet influence because CCCP is their name for the Soviet Union. So probably it's actually a Russian axe that Islamic folks got because if you want to find photos of animal sacrifices that go on today, you can find many, many, many of them because the Islamic folks still sacrifice very large numbers of goats during their annual festival. So. If you want to see what that looks like, you can definitely look it up and have a good idea of it. Sure, yeah, absolutely. There are a wide variety of places. You mostly have to get out of the places where people are uncomfortable about it. I remember that this made the news for this festival in New York City when an Islamic uh, individual practiced their sacrifice in New York City. The non-practicing folks didn't like that. So, yeah, but it, it does... Uh, Call to mind, I, I liked the photo because we have um, the topic of our conversation in the background, that there are lots of live animals behind an axe. And that is really what comes to mind for a lot of us when we open Leviticus, and it certainly will be this evening. So, can someone read chapter 1? Like, from verse 1? That's right, verse 1 to 17, or right. through 17. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make the atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and splash it against the, side of the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, you are to offer a meal without defect. You are to slaughter it at the north side of the altar before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall splash its blood against the sides of the altar. You are to cut it into pieces, and the priests shall arrange them, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to bring all of them and burn them on the altar. 
It is a burnt offering, a, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If the offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, you are to offer a dove or a young pigeon. The priest shall bring it to the altar, bring off the head, and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar. He is to remove the crop and the feathers and throw them down east of the altar where the ashes are. He shall tear it open by the wings, not dividing it completely, and then the priest shall burn it on the wood that is burning on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, and the aroma pleasing to the Lord. All right, thank you very much. So, that's a lot of instructions, right? Yeah. It's a whole lot of things that start to kind of build on themselves, and by the time that she's finished with it, you're thinking, man, I don't know how much longer this is going to go on, but it's an awful lot of instructions like we talked about last week for this obsolete idea where we talked about the obsolete computer and we have an instruction manual about it. And if you just read it like we just did, I think that you're making one of the biggest mistakes that we make when we are trying to make it through the Bible in a year. Because if you read this giant block of text, this whole chapter, it just starts to all hit you in the head and go, man, this is so much stuff. And it's just direction after direction. And there's specifics. And we could spend a lot of time on all these specifics and say, wow, this aspect of why this one has to be at the north side and this one has to be at the entrance. We can go into all of those things and we would probably never make it out of chapter one. So we will not do that. We will try to make it through chapter one tonight because we're going to talk about the overarching idea of the burnt offering. But I wanted someone to read this all as one big block so that it would help us to remember it's better usually to read pieces of sections like this. Break up your reading, throw out the read the Bible in a year plan, unless you've already committed to God that you're going to do that, and reorganize it some. Read this part of it, then go forward to another part and think through these things, because if you're reading it all in one sitting, it tends to kind of wear on you. If you read Leviticus 1 and then Leviticus 2 and you just keep going through that, especially if you're a person who's going to try to do it in three or four months, to read through the whole Bible, you're going to be reading five or six chapters of Leviticus all in a row. And by the time that you're done with that, you're going to be thinking, what does any of this mean? What am I supposed to get out of any of it? And you're going to miss all of the treasure that God has put in here because you've just been trying to plow through and break past all of the things that he's really trying to say to your life. So God has brought these people out of Egypt. He's brought them to this place of discipleship at this foot of the mountain. And then God speaks to Moses, and we have kind of a strange game of telephone, right? Because God is speaking to Moses at the foot of the mountain, and then it tells us in verse 2, speak to the people. So God is speaking to Moses, and then he speaks to the people. And we don't know exactly how this worked out. Was God giving him a few lines, and then Moses turning around and telling them that? Or did God give him the whole download, and he has to give it to them in the format that we receive it? We don't really know exactly what that looked like the first time that Moses spoke it. But we see that from Exodus chapter 20, God started by speaking to the people directly. And we read that chapter last week because when the people get that message and God speaks to them out loud, they are all terrified. And they immediately say, if God's going to speak to us directly, we're going to die. And we can easily look at that and think, oh, well, those people weren't holy enough. They weren't really interested in getting close to God because if they had been, then they could have been speaking directly to God and everything would have been fine. But if you read in Deuteronomy, God says, that's right. They are very wise to have asked for Moses to speak to them because if I had spoken to them, they would have died. Wow, that's a really scary thought that just the voice of God is enough to kill you. Because if you're not sufficiently holy, if you're not prepared for what God is going to say to you, that's going to impact you so severely that you might die. Well, God has been waiting all this time to finally start speaking to them. And when he starts speaking to them, he doesn't start with any of the things we would want, right? He doesn't say, you are my precious treasure. You guys are so special to me. I've saved you out of Egypt. I've chosen you out of all the people. Now, he is going to say those things. But when God brings them right here to the foot of the mountain and says, this is what I have to say to you, he starts out with saying, when you bring a sacrifice, you're supposed to do it this way. Now, that's not the kind of message that most of us really want to hear from God, directions of how we are supposed to worship him. And I would say even that sacrifice is one of the least popular words in the whole Bible, right? Maybe one of the least popular in the English language. 
If somebody is talking to you about you needing to sacrifice, most of us want to shut the door. Most of us immediately say, no, not in this phase of my life. I'm out of the sacrificing season. I need to be in the blessing season. It's time for me to get something from God, not to give something to him. And yet, God says at the start of their relationship, when he's really starting to restore his loving relationship with them, the very first thing you need to know is how to sacrifice properly. It's one of those words that goes along with humility, perseverance, patience, self-control. These are all biblical words that all of us would prefer to just kind of skip over and go, well, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about joy and peace and hope and freedom and all the things that we really want from God and not what he expects of us. And so we find ourselves at a spot where Leviticus is hard to understand. It's hard to relate to. And when you finally do understand it, you figure out that it's about sacrifice. And that immediately makes you go, well, why did I put in the effort? What am I doing here where now I'm learning about sacrifice? But verse 2 tells us when you bring an offering, right? That's what God says. This reminds me of Jesus talking about fasting. He said, when you fast, right? He didn't say if. He didn't say if you feel like it. He said when. These are the directions for how you are to fast. And the same thing with God here in Leviticus says when you bring an offering. And so there's an expectation that these people are going to bring livestock. Now this offering, the burnt offering, is the first type that we ever see offered to God in the whole scripture. You see it with Noah. Right after he gets off the ark, once he wants to praise God, he makes burnt offerings to God. And we see it going on where Abraham and Moses will bring burnt offerings to God even before they have these directions for how they're supposed to do it. And then we get this list that Hannah just kindly read for us of all the different options for sacrifice and the directions that you can use to sacrifice them properly. There were those three major categories, the animals from the herd, the cattle or oxen, and the animals from the flock, the sheep or the goats, and the birds. Now, for the first two categories, if you notice, they have to be male, right? That's what it says for animals from the herd and animals from the flock. They must be male. Now, people kind of speculate because it simply doesn't tell us why the birds don't have to be male. I think the best answer that I've seen is that it's very hard to tell what these two different types of birds, pigeons and turtle doves, it's very difficult. You have to basically be an expert to tell which one of these is the male. And so God is being merciful and allowing them to choose any of them they can get. But why would God want a male sacrifice? This is the most valuable sacrifice, as we will see as we study Leviticus. Why is that? Because Jesus is a male. Okay, because Jesus is a male, but why is that important? Why did he want a male animal? Okay, so maybe there's some primacy there, an order of some sort. What was that? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, I think that there's an aspect of that, that maybe there is some hierarchy. Uh, I think personally that nothing else in their culture, the male animal was the most valuable. Now, we know that by studying it, that we can prove that they valued these because we have ancient price lists that are thousands of years old of this is how much a bull was worth, this is how much a cow is worth, and we can see they valued the bull at a higher rate. So if nothing else, I think God is saying, bring your very best. You need to bring the animal that is the top animal in your mind for this offering. And go ahead. I was actually going to hit on that, but also if you're bringing the, the best unblemished male, yeah. um, you're sacrificing that, you're also um, ending that bloodline. Yeah. So it's even more of a sacrifice when you're sacrificing the best male bloodline. I think that's right. And it's honestly, if you put it that way, an exercise in faith, right? That God is still going to give you a decent turnout of a herd if you're sacrificing the best males. Because what we see as we study the burnt offering, this happens twice a day, every single day. In the morning and the evening, they have to make a burnt offering. In addition to that, you have voluntary offerings, you have extra for holy days, you have extra for cleansing and purification. So on some days, you might have more than 100 animals that are being killed for this burnt offering alone. Not even any of the other sacrifices, just the burnt offering, more than 100 animals. 
So if you think about that, if you've got these herds and you're bringing your very best and you're doing that over and over and over again, well, what's going to happen naturally? It's going to be really the worst that are left over, right? You're going to end up with animals that everybody else doesn't really want. But because of God's blessing, they don't end up with that. They end up with really spectacular quality animals despite their willingness to obey and do what God has directed. So I think that's a really good point, Jim. Yeah. So, I'm just clarifying. Unblemished would mean that they have not breeded, or would that have anything to do with it? I mean, because you're saying that it would end the bloodline if they brought the unblemished male. So, so I think... Does that mean that they haven't reproduced? No, it, it would line? simply mean... So they could absolutely have already studded a, a cow at that point, but they... Unblemished simply means, without defect, is all that means in the Hebrew, that these are animals that don't have any problems. And you'll see, especially in the prophet Malachi, that was the problem, that when our pastor rightfully talks about robbing God of the tithe, one of the things the people were doing was finding animals that had problems. So they went out to their herd and they found an animal that had a lame leg, or they found an animal that looked really funny, or looked like all it wanted to do was beat its head against a tree all day, and they thought, you know what, I'm taking that one. Because it's really kind of annoying that I'm giving away the best of my herd. And so Malachi is sent by God to say, you are robbing God by choosing these animals that have problems. So I, I think we're not necessarily saying they couldn't have reproduced before they're sacrificed. Uh, but I think they probably wouldn't have most of the time. But all of the families are required to bring something with the obvious principle, if you look through these categories, you're bringing the best you can afford. Now, the wealth of these people is going to vary quite a bit. A lot of people aren't going to be able to afford to bring a bull because they simply have no cattle. Some people are not even going to be able to afford to bring a sheep or a ram because they don't have any flocks. And so they go down the list. But rabbis have held, basically since they have been writing about this passage, that you can't just go out and catch a bird. You're not allowed to take a net and run out there and find yourself a bird and bring it over to the tent. You have to have a domesticated bird. In the Middle East, still today, if you go over there, there are pigeon houses all over the place in the Middle East, and they still raise these pigeons, not for this purpose, but they eat them. They have a lot of bird farms that they raise these birds around. So they would have had the availability of farm-raised birds that they could have sacrificed. But why couldn't a person bring a wild animal as an offering? Okay, yeah, what do you mean by that? Could be they, not not food, yeah. Just well, I mean, you, you could argue they're losing food, but they didn't put the time in, right? They didn't. Yeah. There, there's a, a brutality about it. Go for it. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the stuff he said are dirty or completely wild. They're not domesticated. No, I think you're right. Yeah, Stephen. In, in, some of the, in some places in the Bible, when they talk about the sacrifice, the Lord wants you to bring animals that you've raised yeah. and that you've taken care of and that you love so that it will be a real sacrifice to you. That's and exactly you, right. Uh, you know, yeah, and, and I see that uh, especially in the story with David. Go ahead, Arlene. Yeah. So that would go with the defects also. I, I don't know. I mean, I know it talks about it in here, but I don't know. Yeah, no, it will be an end times prophecy, right? That they are expecting to re consecrate yeah, that. They had a red heifer. Yep. And they lost them all. And they, they're still trying to find one. They've been trying to breed them so that they've got one. And they haven't been able to do it. Yeah, that's right. And, and it is very difficult. And it. There are many people who believe that that is going to be a sign that the end times are approaching much faster. So yes, it is a significant idea um, that it may be the way that it is. I'm always cautious about how all of those prophecies line up of which one comes first because it's so difficult to align all of the timelines of the various prophets and say... 
absolutely. Yeah. So David, in his experience when he is king, he finds that he is ordered to make the census, right? And God brings punishment on the people because of the census that he makes. And then in order to stop the plagues that are going on with David's census that he has done, God tells him to go to a specific household and get a sacrifice and make the sacrifice of a burnt offering. And I have here on the screen 2 Samuel 24, 24, where David is offered by this man, Aruna to have the sacrifice for free. He says, this is for God's house. This is going to be great. I'm going to give you what you need because I want to be a part of this ministry, and I just want to give it to you. And David responds, no, I'll buy them from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. I think that's the principle here. David is saying, it's not any use for me to offer something that didn't cost me at all. I mean, he's a king. He could afford nearly infinite sacrifices, as we will see with his son, who sacrifices hundreds and hundreds of animals a day and many, many thousands on the dedication of the temple. But David is still saying it matters if your sacrifice costs you something, right? It matters to us today, right? If our offerings cost us nothing, then it's not a sacrifice, right? If you give God your leftovers, if whatever you have of time or money or energy, if you say, you know what, God, I think I've got 30 seconds here at the end of the night. Let's spend some prayer time. I can just spot you that. You're not sacrificing, are you? You're not really showing him that you care about him at all. You're saying you're worth nothing to me. You're the leftover, and I'm going to take whatever I have at the end, and I'm going to give you that. But God is saying, no, if you want to worship me properly, you're going to bring the best. You're going to bring the thing that costs you a lot, that doesn't have a defect, that doesn't have some complaint that you can come up with about it. You are going to offer the best that you have. But what does Leviticus say is the purpose for bringing this sacrifice? You might have missed it there. It's in verse 4. Atonement. All right, so that's what your translation says. What other translations do you guys have? What word does it say there at the end of verse 4? It shall be acceptable in your behalf as... What do you guys have? Okay, as peace. All right. Anybody else? To purify, okay. Atonement, all right. Well, some English translations say forgiveness or to take away your sins. Some of the really formal ones will say expiation. That's a really churchy word that only a few of us might be able to define correctly. But atonement is a pretty good translation of this idea. Now, we have a very complex theological problem here where God has just said, you need to bring these animals and they will be acceptable as atonement on your behalf. So that leads to our question of the week that we ended with last week. Did God need the blood of the animals to be able to forgive sins. Okay. Did the sins get forgiven through the blood? Temporarily. Temporarily, okay. Because it wasn't the final solution. Jesus was the final solution. Okay. All right. Did he need it or require it? It's a good question. Jim, I think you told me you had a good answer. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. I don't usually call people out, but I've been waiting for a week for your answer. <laughs> oh, well, never mind then. <laughs> of course. So, I think what I, was, what, what I was going is he doesn't need it. Okay. But it is like the, that is the, uh, the sign of the sacrifice. Okay. It is the blood. So it's not like he needs the blood. That's just part of the sacrifice. Okay. Is, is the blood. Um, so, yeah. I think I had a better uh, answer. Well, that's all right. But it's in your heart there. I'll, I'll yeah, it's probably just because I called on you. But <laughs> in any event, anybody else? Other thoughts? The life is in the blood. Okay, yeah, absolutely. We're going to quote that verse in just a moment to make a point that uh, is further about the burnt offering. But I've kind of, as usual with my questions of the week, been a little disingenuous on it because what I wanted to really emphasize is that I asked, 
is it required that God have the blood of animals to forgive sins? Okay, well, there you go. Abraham is credited as a righteousness. And then if... Oh, can somebody please read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 11? And that will answer our question pretty succinctly, I think. Yeah, Hebrews 10, 4 through 11. It is impossible for the blood of the bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for. So verse 11, or 3 verse 11. For the body you prepared for. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you are not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor, nor were you pleased with them. So they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day um, after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away his sins. Okay, so that tells us pretty succinctly, right? Again and again, they offer the same sacrifices. They keep doing it over and over and over, and they never take away sins. They never forgive. Now, that's a critical passage for Christians reading Leviticus. We could probably spend all of our time just on a comparison between Leviticus and Hebrews. We could just do that probably for several years if we kept going through and comparing the work of Jesus to the work that God has commanded of these Hebrews earlier. But Hebrews tells us back in chapter 7 that you can just look at how many animals die to let you know that it's a repeated task that never gets the job done, right? It just keeps happening again and again and again. If I was to give you some kind of cleaner, and there was a spot over here on the wall, and I said, scrub that off, and I asked you to do it several thousand times, you're going to tell me I'm not doing it at some point, right? You're going to find that that substance that I've asked you to clean it off with doesn't work, and you're going to say, forget it. I'm not going to keep trying because it's not coming off. So if you misunderstand the purpose of these sacrifices, they can seem unnecessary, cruel, and wasteful, right? You can look at these animals, and there's thousands and thousands of animals that God commanded be killed, and yet we're told they didn't forgive sins. Not one time did they actually allow sins to be forgiven, as Hannah said, completely. But these sacrifices aren't like the others. As we'll go through Leviticus, the burnt offering is totally different than all of the rest of the sacrifices. In this one, you don't keep any part of the animal except for the blood and the skin. And you don't get to use any of those things. It's not like you get any benefit from this burnt offering at all. Not one part of it is enjoyed by the owner of the animal or even the Levites. You have an entire animal. As some of you have pointed out, that you might have raised very lovingly. You might have thought, oh, this animal is going to be really good for milk in the case of some animals later on, for reproducing more animals in the case of these burnt offerings with their males. But in that case, you've got all these ideas of what that animal is going to be able to do for your family. And instead, God says you have to sacrifice it. And that certainly brings back to mind the sacrifice of Isaac to me and where I originally came to this study that these people had a lot of different thoughts about what these sacrifices were going to be before they were commanded to die. And right before their eyes, a young and healthy animal isn't just killed, they kill it. The person who brings it is responsible for the killing. It just kind of reminds me of like in the New Testament how the Israelites knew Jesus as to get rid of the Romans, but instead he dies on the cross because they thought he was one thing, but yeah, I think that's a great point, that many times God wants to do something different with what he has given us than our expectations, right? Many times God decides that things need to go a different way than the way we would have planned. But you've got one of these valuable possessions. For some of these people, one of the most valuable things that you owned, you slaughter it and it goes up in smoke right before your eyes. You're watching it just be burned. 
Now, I don't know about you guys, but I like the idea that my tithes and offerings do something. I like the idea that as a board member, I can look at it and say, I know where this went. I know the accountability for this money. If we had a service and pastor called for us to all bring $1,000 to the front and put it in a bonfire, I don't think very many of you would be enthusiastic about that, right? I think most of us would pretty quickly say, nope, we're going somewhere else. I might give $1,000, but if you're going to burn it, I don't think so. But their wealth is going up in smoke right in front of their eyes. This is more than $1,000 to most of them. This is many months of wages for some of them to buy these animals. We've just proven that it didn't lead to the forgiveness of sins. So what was the purpose? What were these animals being killed for? Why is God commanding them to apparently waste their animal? What's he doing? Okay. Yeah. What's it accomplishing, though? It's not accomplishing forgiveness. What's the purpose of the sacrifice? Obedience. Okay, testing your obedience. What? Obedience. Okay. Symbolic? Okay, yeah. But there's a weird church word, like we talked about expiation. What's happening here is called propitiation. Now, propitiation isn't a word we are ever going to use at the workplace, right? You're never going to just be talking to your buddies and go, you know, I was thinking about propitiation the other night, and it was just incredible. I just couldn't get off of it. I just kept thinking and thinking, and I spent a few hours just contemplating propitiation. How about you guys? What are your thoughts about it? Most people are going to walk the other direction, and some of them might call a number to have some people help you out if you bring that up to them. But it's critical that we understand this concept. It means something very significant. It means to appease. It means that you have two parties in conflict. You have two enemies, and propitiation is the thing in between them. You bring that because now they aren't enemies anymore. We see that pretty regularly in Scripture. But we know that the Bible tells us that God is wrathful against sin, and it actually says sinners are his enemies, right? Somebody please read Romans 5, 6 through 11, and we will see that spelled out for us. Romans 5, 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, but perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. All right, thank you. So it tells us there in Romans that we were the enemies of God, that we were opposed to him and we were in conflict. And while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. That's one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible, right? We weren't just separated from God. We weren't just lost sheep. Those things are true. But we were actively fighting against God. We were opposed to him, and he loved us so much that he still sought us out. He still redeemed us while we were his enemies. Now, when you think about being an enemy of God, being somebody's enemy means at least on some level there's conflict, right? You at least intend to do something wrong against them if you are a sinner. Now, think of the most powerful being that you can imagine that isn't God. If you think of that for just a second, just think of whatever that is, ideally not something fictional. Ideally some kind of being that is the most powerful entity that you can ever imagine. If you read the Bible much, you know that that's not a human, right? You know that that's not going to be a, a pilot in a fighter jet that is going to get the airplane lost, right? We're not going to have any of these powerful beings that are humans. It's some kind of angelic creature, some kind of spiritual being that is incredibly powerful, but not as powerful as God. 
Now, if you think about that incredibly powerful being, how long would it take God to defeat them in a fight? Not even an instant, right? The most powerful being that we have ever learned about outside of God is not even a struggle for God. It's not even a moment's difficulty. God wouldn't even really have to think about it. It would just be over. The second he wanted it to be over, it's done. We talked about this with the battle at the end of Revelation last week, at the end of our class, that this giant army is surrounding the figures of God's army. And then the next verse, they're defeated. It doesn't even say there is a battle. It just says they're defeated and then they are cast into the lake of fire. Because God is so powerful that the most powerful army you can imagine is defeated instantaneously. Now I bring all this up to say God isn't trying to defeat his enemies. If he was trying to defeat his enemies with power, the fight would be done, right? If God wanted to annihilate sinners, we would all be gone. If God wanted us in hell, the moment that we sinned, we would immediately be in hell, right? There wouldn't be any struggle. There wouldn't be any wrestling. If you remember the story of Jacob wrestling with God, that only goes all night because God's throwing the fight. It's pretty obvious, right? God is trying to save his human enemies. Now remember that these English translations say that the purpose of the sacrifice, the purpose of the burnt offering is atonement, to take away your sins, expiation. All of those English words are great, but the basic Hebrew word actually means to cover specifically with bitumen. Now I don't know if you know what bitumen is, but it's this stuff. There's in the island of Trinidad, the largest deposit of bitumen is right up near the surface. And this stuff occurs naturally pretty much all over the world. The La Brea Tar Pits are another good example out in California. Yucky, slimy, yeah. But tar is kind of a, a lot of different substances. But yes, bitumen is a specific version of that. And what the Hebrew is saying is that the burnt offering is covering your sins with that. Now, if you don't know, bitumen is the original kind of basis for most of our asphalt, roofing tars. We use a lot of different substances now, but 150 years ago, tons of people were just pulling this stuff out of the ground, boiling it down, and laying it out on roads, or putting it on roofs, or using it for all kinds of purposes. They used it to build the Tower of Babel in the Scripture, and Moses' basket is sealed with it. And so... It's very similar to a roofing tar, and it just sits there waiting for people to come collect it. And this is the stuff that God says you need to cover yourself with. You need to go get that, and you need to smear it all over yourself in the burnt offering. Now, thankfully, it's metaphorical, right? Thankfully, it's the blood of the animals that cover us with bitumen. Why on earth would people be asked by God to figuratively cover themselves in roofing tar. What's he doing? Yeah. So he can't see it. I mean, that's a, a metaphorical way to explain it, but so that they can be near God, right? Because our sin is deadly. And it's not just deadly to us. It's deadly especially when we get close to God. The burnt offering is a shield so that these people can live as close as possible to God. These sacrifices, they don't protect these people from God's anger. They protect them from His holiness. God's holiness is so powerful that we've said before, it will burn up anything unholy that gets too close. It just does automatically. We used the analogy before that the holiness of God is like the brightness of the sun. Now, the Earth's atmosphere is really important to us, right? God designed our planet very specially so that it's capable of protecting us. And we talked a little bit about being sunburned last week. But if you don't realize it, if you were right outside the Earth like an astronaut living on the International Space Station, if you go outside of that and you didn't have a spacesuit, if you just somehow were able to just put that helmet on and not worry about breathing, almost immediately your skin would start to really be damaged, tremendously damaged. 
Because the UV radiation, the brightness of the sun is so much more powerful without the protection of our atmosphere that it would start to destroy your skin immediately. There wouldn't be a sunblock that we could come up with. You have to have physical protection because that light is so powerful. To live in space requires this very specific shielding from the light. The closer you get to the sun, the more shielding you need, right? When people talk about, we're going to go to Mars, we're going to make a colony over there, that's okay because we're getting further away, right? But then there are other people who say, let's go to Venus. That's going to be great. Well, as long as you're on the dark side, because if you get on that bright side, hundreds and hundreds of degrees, and even if you ignore the temperature, the light is so bright, it would break you down almost immediately. This is exactly what the burnt offering did. This Lord of all, the one who Scripture tells us dwells in unapproachable light, is going to live in a tent in the desert. It's as if the sun, the incredibly bright sun, is suddenly inside a tent in the desert. Now, for that to happen, there has to be a covering. For God to be there, there has to be a change. God had drawn near for the first time in a way that was totally different than every other time before. That's what we talked about last week, where Moses can't go in the tent. The presence of God is so powerful in that moment that God is not going to be able to be there without starting to destroy everything that's around the tent. The blood of these animals acted as a covering. They needed something thick and dark as roofing tar. And I brought a little piece of butyl tape here. This is not actually bitumen, but it is what they used before that. And I wanted to demonstrate, I've got a super bright light. And if you don't believe me, I can definitely shine it in your eyes for you. But I don't think any of you can see any of that light through this piece of butyl tape. Because bitumen is so protective that even with an incredibly bright light behind it, you can't see anything at all, right? You can't even know that there is light there. The way that this propitiation worked, the way that this covering of bitumen worked, is that God's holiness is shielded just the right amount. God has shielded His presence from them just the amount that is necessary so that they are able to live right beside Him. Now, how do we know that this is the right track? Well, two instances of this kind of thing happen in the Old Testament where the burnt offering stops. Because remember, this is a thing that had to go every morning, every evening, and many, many times in between. This propitiation, this covering of bitumen over and over again, every single day, at least twice a day. Yet, we remember the story when the Philistines capture the ark, right? When they capture that ark, they bring it over, and what starts happening to them? They get sick. They get tumors immediately. Almost as if they are living in outer space with that UV radiation hitting their skin. Tumors start to sprout on them overnight, and some of them start dying. Why does that happen? Well, certainly the presence of God, but it's not just the presence of God. They aren't making the burnt offering. They have brought God's holy of holies into their city, and they aren't doing what God said you had to do to live beside it. They've decided, eh, we've conquered this God. We don't have to worry about it. And so they are ignoring his commandment. Another example of this is when God is about to allow his temple to be captured and about to allow it to be looted, in Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel sees a vision, and he sees a vision of the presence of God lifting up out of the temple and leaving. Now he sees that vision, I think, because what God is doing is evacuating the temple so that it can be looted. What would have happened if God's presence was still in that temple when those people showed up? They would all die, right? It's not going to get looted. It doesn't matter, right? We see even when the man simply tries to steady the Ark of the Covenant with his hand, he drops dead instantaneously. And so if soldiers who are coming in there to steal the precious things of God's temple march in there, and God's presence was still in there at its fullest, they would instantly die. And so we again see God's presence required this covering. It was necessary that this bitumen covering be over the temple or the tent of meeting in the early days as a shield from God's holiness. But why blood? Why not furs or skins or some other part of the animal? Because a lot of people view blood as life. Okay, yeah. Somebody quoted it, right? 
The life is in the blood, right? That's originally a quote that God speaks to Noah. When Noah is making some of these first burnt offerings. I think that's absolutely right. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar. For as life, it is the blood that makes atonement. When an animal has no blood, how long is it going to live? Almost immediately, right? It's almost immediately going to die. We all see that. Anytime you see one of these news reports, that's why horror movies put red corn syrup all over everywhere. It horrifies us because we know when there's a lot of blood everywhere that life has been lost. That there is tremendous danger to anyone who has lost that much blood. And so the deaths of these innocent animals are standing in the place of the people. Now, they're not forgiving their sins. We've said that. They can't accomplish the ultimate cleaning of what these people need. They just basically have this tape over their sins. They're able to walk up to God. They're able to live with God. But they're having to wear spiritual armor that protects them from the holiness of God. God had two options in this situation. Either constantly refreshed blood from the burnt offerings or to leave the tent. That was it. If God wanted to stay amongst the people, there had to be these burnt offerings day and night, over and over again. These animals are a stopgap. The distance between God and sin is immeasurable, right? It's infinite. Now, it's not infinite because we can accumulate infinite sins, but it's because His holiness is infinite. He has immeasurable holiness, so anything that's on the other side is infinitely far apart from Him. And so infinite distance requires infinite payment, right? To be able to close the gap, if you are infinity away from something, you have to have something infinite to be able to close the gap. In the fullness of time, God supplies the permanent solution that we've been alluding to earlier. Abraham had foretold this to his promised son Isaac, right? When we studied this story and we looked at how Isaac asked the question, where is the sacrifice? Where is the animal that we are going to use to offer a burnt offering to God? And Abraham responds, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. It's been said that these sacrifices, these hundreds and hundreds of sacrifices in a year, are the shadow of the cross cast backwards in time that people are able to see the cross through what's going on with these animals. But now God lives not just near, but in His people, right? Because now all of this stuff that had been covered in blood, covered in blood over and over again, if you look through all of the things, Hebrews says almost every part of the tent has to be sprinkled with blood. Almost everything that's involved. Anything that you can think of that went on in there. Even the little pieces of the forks that are used to turn the meat of these sacrifices has to be sprinkled with the blood of these animals. And so, we have to be sprinkled with blood, not just in part, right? We're not able to just be covered a little bit with blood, because if we allow God only to wash some parts of our lives and say, this part is going to be for me, I'm going to keep this separate, well then it can't be near God. Because God is going to live inside you as the Holy Spirit. And for God's presence to be that close, every part of you has to be washed in blood. We no longer need these shields of the animal's burnt offering because the blood of Jesus has become the covering for all sins. 1 John 2 tells us that He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The blood of Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, the burnt offering, the propitiation, if you want to use that churchy word, for all the world's sins. Now, there are some people who want to take that and say, oh, well, universalism, right? Because Jesus has already paid the price for all the sins that will ever be done. And yet, 
We know that this doesn't happen that way, right? We know that there are millions of people who have rejected the offer, the free gift of God. They are still saying, I would rather be your enemy. You have made the offer, you have paid all of the price, and I would rather be your enemy. The tent no longer has the curtain, right? The tent doesn't even exist. The temple doesn't even exist. But when the temple stood, at the death of Jesus, the curtain is ripped all the way. Because now the presence of God is able to come right beside us, and God can live in us permanently. The burnt offering is the first offering of every single day. Every day that they start, there's another burnt offering. And it had to happen that way because there is no true worship that can begin while sin is uncovered. Only those whose sins are atoned for can enjoy God's fellowship and praise Him. So, they have been put under this covering. This bitumen is making them ready for life with God. They are not ready completely because God has four more sacrifices that He is going to reveal to them. Next week will be a very different sacrifice because we've just been talking about blood and how blood is important in every aspect of this. And yet next week, we'll have no blood at all. So, think about this idea that God has commanded a very, very bloody sacrifice where you're in there, you're doing the killing, you're laying your hand on it, everything about it is getting you messy and yucky and everything is gross. And then the next thing he does is say, Here's a sacrifice that has no blood at all, no filth at all, no issues whatsoever. And we'll talk about why that is. But our question of the week for next week is why does God demand worship? He doesn't just say, if you want to, you can worship me. He says, you must worship me to all humans everywhere. Everyone who has ever been born has to worship God. Why would he do that? Is it like the atheists say that he's just self-centered? So, we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> now, are there any other comments or questions about the burnt offering? I know we could spend, as I said, a very long time about what it means to wash the offerings and what it means for different aspects of the blood to be put in different places. But it's important that we mostly understand that this covering has to happen before any other aspect of life with God can. When you were saying that everybody has to have these burnt offerings, was it still just the man of the household? Yes. So they are certainly representative, and the specifics of when they bring the burnt offering um, will be covered later on in Leviticus, but the, um, the daily is a communal offering, and so... It really depends on the period of history, when, which animal they're using for that. Because in some periods, it seems that it was sort of a communal group 